Welcome to Friday Q&A to everybody who got a question in this week. Thank you guys so much. There was lots going on this week. I just got back from a show in Adelaide, which was wild and crazy, and I will have a vlog up about it at the start of next week, hopefully. Until then, if you have questions for next week's Q&A, please get them in the comments. We're gonna be doing Lick of the Week later on as well, so let's get straight into the questions. Great question, how do you know if your band is ready to start gigging? I guess there are some very obvious factors in there, namely that you've got enough material to fill the slot. You know, a lot of the time, if you're an original band and you're doing a support set, 30 minutes seems to be the sort of going amount of music that you would need, which is normally, I guess, depending on the style of music you play, eight to 10 songs. So granted, if you've got the songs, and you've rehearsed them enough where you're confident that you can, you know, sort of not just play them, but actually perform them because playing live is a totally different thing to just playing the songs. So my advice would be that if you are in a position where you think you can play the songs and you can actually perform them to an audience and you can really, you know, get in front of people and confidently strut your stuff uh, playing songs that hopefully you like playing, that's another big factor, then I think you're ready to gig. One thing in favor of that approach, obviously, is that by the time you do start gigging, you're gonna sound a lot more polished and you'll probably enjoy the process. But I think there's a lot to be said that like, if you feel like you're kind of not quite ready to start gigging, just go and do it. Book like, you know, over whether it's over a couple of weeks or a couple of months, book like four or five gigs straight off and then that is going to give you some impetus to really get your stuff together. And hopefully by the end of that small run of gigs, you'll feel a whole lot better about actually gigging and you'll have a much better idea about what you need to work on for your live show. Because you can, again, it's one of those things before you do any gigs, you can go, oh, I think we need to do this and I think we need to do that. And you can have a lot of ideas, but you haven't tested those ideas in the real world. So my advice would be if you think you're almost ready to gig, just take a few gigs. Do it you know, it's a classic saying, get it out of your system, basically, get the nerves out and use them more of an as more of an opportunity to sort of go, okay, cool, what do we really need to work on? Rather than, well, what, what, what's the idea of what we think we need to work on? So I think, I think just go and do it. If you've got the material and you can sort of play it all in time and in tune, just get out there and start doing it because gigging is the best experience. Like one gig to me is worth 10 rehearsals. Okay, so this question is a bit of a two in one. Does the Axe FX 3 have a boss or Roland dimension mode? It does, it actually has three different dimension modes in there, which is pretty cool. And does it sound like the new boss DC2W was a craft? Uh, I think the answer is they sound really close. So at the moment I'm on mode four of the dimension and I've dialed in the Axe FX 3. It has a high dimension mode. You gotta play around a little bit with the rate and the depth to get it pretty close, but uh, I'm just gonna AB between them. I won't tell you which one's which. They sound pretty similar, I think. They, they do sound different at the moment, I will say that, but it's the same kind of vibe and really, that's what you're going for. And if you don't like the push buttons on the dimension, like some of you guys have mentioned, the Axe FX 3 lets you change the rate, the depth, all the other parameters. So it's a far more flexible machine that still captures the vibe, I think. Anyway, let's have a listen. So like I said, they do sound a little bit different. I haven't spent a whole lot of time dialing them in, but I guess if you did want to spend the time, you could get them pretty close. But uh, by making just a few adjustments to the depth and the rate, it already, it's, you know, it's got the same kind of character going on. And uh, for me, I actually like the Axe FX 3 more because I can tweak it more. And depending on the kind of sound that I'm going for, I can dial it in a little bit more precisely uh, than the DC2. But the DC2 is just such a cool pedal. I really, really like how simple and easy it is to use and gives you like a limited palette, but often you can be more creative with a limited palette. So I think it is a great pedal. It's, it's worth getting if you're somebody who doesn't love chorus, but you want a good chorus sound, I think, as I said in the reviews. So yeah, 
that's what the XFX3 uh, dimension mode sounds like. Again, it's based on the rack version. That's why I was using the SDD mode. I don't know how close the boss is to the real SDD thing, so that will probably be a better comparison if you've got a real SDD to try it out with. So a few months ago, I did do a demo of the Serotone Son of Yeti amplifier, which I had actually bought. I bought it secondhand, granted, but I really, really like that amp. And now that I've got the Axe FX3 and, you know, I bought a Triaxis recently and I'm just, yeah, I'm a gear whore. I realized that it's in my blood. I hadn't bought some gear for a while and I've totally relapsed again. So yeah, the Serotone Son of Yeti. Look, I think if you are looking for a great modded Marshall sound and you don't need like a 50 watt tube head. Oh, there's a bug. Look at that guy. What was I saying? Yeah, in the sort of like lunchbox amp category, I think it is the best sounding out of all the amps that I've tried, including the Marshall Origin, including the EVH5153 lunchbox, including the Dark Terror. Um, I like modern Marshall tones. That's granted, those other amps don't necessarily do those things. But for me, I think if I could just live with one kind of, it's a little bit bigger than a lunchbox head. It's actually, it's right here. It's a head, you know, it's a little bit smaller than a Mesa Mark series head. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's pretty chunky. It's still pretty weighty. Uh, I wonder if you could get it as hand luggage on a plane. I reckon you might just get by. Uh, but yeah, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's tubes. It's got some big transformers and stuff like that. But for modern martial sounds, I love it. Um, to me, the amp that it most closely resembles in the Axe FX3 is the Friedman BE 2018C45. Uh, if I want to cop this tone, then I find that using that model gets me really close. And it's not dissimilar to like the Cameron amp models or any of the other modern Marshalls. So look, I'm a huge fan of this amp. I, I would buy it again, especially given the price that I paid for. I got it quite cheap. So uh, 6v6s, never would have guessed that I love 6v6s in a in a Marshall style amp, but it does the job. And yeah, honestly, out of all the amps I own, uh, if I was gigging with amps, I reckon I'd just take this most of the time. I, I could do a ragdoll gig on this amp, basically, which um, says a lot because I went through lots of amps trying to find my sound doing that. And obviously now I use the Axe FX stuff because it's, A, it sounds good, and B, it's also incredibly convenient. And the band runs in-ears now, so having to have like an amp on stage to monitor myself isn't essential, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'll have to do it, you know, just pull this amp out and do a gig with it at some point uh, because I love the way it sounds. You can probably guess that I'm a bit of a fan of the Serotone Son of Yeti, right? So yeah, do it. I think it's worth the money. They're great. And Nick from Serotone has, he gives amazing support and they've got a really active Facebook group as well. Um, and he's a cool guy. Like I basically bought this amp and wrote to him and said, hey, I think you made a great amp, well done. And he wrote back to me within like an hour and I sent him the video and stuff and he shared it. So he's a, he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, and it's good if you're in Australia as well because they're in Malaysia. It's like one of the few cases where buying gear and shipping it to Australia is cheaper than if you're in the US. So yeah, win all round. Lou Lombardi has a question. He basically says, given I own all these amazing amps and I'm very fortunate to own as many amazing amplifiers as I do, why do I mess around with this modeling stuff? Uh, he goes on to say that, you know, an Axe FX3 is basically more expensive than a new Marshall. So why would I buy an Axe FX3 when I could buy another Marshall perhaps? So it's a good question. I mean, it probably seems to a lot of people that it's like I'm getting paid to make all these videos like oh you know Leon's just a shill for big digital or something uh, uh you know i just shill for stuff that i like and no one's paying me to do that stuff the axe 3 is the most impressive piece of guitar gear that i've got uh probably since ever i want to say probably since i got an axe effects ultra a while ago like i got the ultra and that totally changed my life as a guitar player. It changed the way I approach tones. It changed the sort of tones that I could take out on the road with me. It changed the way I record. It changed the way I practice. It changed the way that I teach. Such a great piece of gear. I upgraded to an AX8 not long after that, and that took it next level again. And that's still an amazing piece of gear that I use live. And then the Axe 3, it, you know, to me, the Axe FX 3, it's in that category of gear where it's not something that's trying to sound like something else. It just has its own sound. Um, they did a video recently with Sinister Gates where he basically says the same thing. It's like, you know, he's not interested in trying to just replicate amp tones. He's actually trying to go out and create his own tones. And for me, the reason that I like using the Axe FX 
3. The reason I like using the AX8 is because I approach it from the perspective of something like I'm trying to find my sound with this piece of gear rather than trying to use that to make it sound like all my other pieces of gear. Now, the reason that I own all these tube amps, again, is because I like these amps because I can use them to find my own sound. And some of them just, they still sound incredible. Like that Soldano, when I play that, it makes me play a certain way. It makes me channel uh, all my influences in a different way and it's inspiring to play. So that's why I keep them. And the Axe FX is equally as inspiring for me. I plug into that thing nearly every day and end up writing something, which I think if you're a guitar player and you're being creative and you know, you're know you aspiring to be a creative musician anyway, that's what it's all about. So uh, if you're not into the modeling thing, nobody's forcing you to, to use it. You know, it's to me, it sounds inspiring and that's it. So I guess that's the most uh, heartfelt, honest assessment of the situation. But yeah, no, I'm just a shill for big digital anyway. Okay, tube versus solid state rectification in amplifiers. Essentially, I would characterize tube rectifiers as being saggy and solid state rectifiers as being tighter. I've got this Mesa Boogie dual rectifier here, which lets me switch between tube and solid state rectification. At the moment, I'm on tube rectification, so I'll play a clip and then I will switch over and give you guys an idea. Essentially, to me, it's, it's kind of like if you think of like a Marshall JTM 45, right? A Marshall style amp with a tube rectifier, uh, it's not as high powered as something like a Plexi. So once we got solid state rectifiers, you know, they could drive amps with more power. And uh, the classic recording with the Plexi or the Blues Breaker kind of thing is, you know, the Beano album, John Miles Blues Breakers. Think of that kind of really, uh, you know, pushed, compressed, sweet guitar tone, as opposed to something like a 70s sort of thing with a plexi that might have more of a, an aggressive crack. So we will start uh, with tube rectifications, uh, tube rectification, and then we'll do solid state rectification, having a look at the different types of rectification. I'll try to play the same thing with the same kind of intensity, starting with tubes. <laughs> ever consider collaborating with other players over the internet using file sharing and things like that? Definitely. I think it's one of the most important and amazing developments that's happened in the world of music in the last 20 years where you no longer have to be uh, anywhere near one another to make a record. And I think the reality is, is this is just an extension of the way people have been working in studios since we've had multi-track recordings. You know, before there was multi-track recordings, you needed the whole band there and you basically, you know, put up a couple of microphones and you do it and you cut it live. But since you had multi-track recording, you know, it's no longer essential that all the musicians be in the studio at the same time. And I know in the past working on the Ragdoll stuff, that's the way, um, that's really the only way we've been able to make it work because everybody has lives outside of the band and there's always, you know, uh, family commitments and work commitments that we, constantly work around and you know that's just life especially playing in an independent band like we do where you just got to make things work and you got to you know make the most of your time when you can get together so we would spend that time that we can spend all together rehearsing and tightening up the songs and writing but when it came to recording it was a lot less uh, there was a lot less importance on all being together at the same time like with back to zero uh, I can't actually remember a time when all three of us oh no I can there was maybe one session when all three of us were at the session, but that was tracking drums and Ryan and I were just sitting there, you know, checking our phones and, you know, kind of tuning in and out of the session. So I think in a lot of ways, uh, you can have a much more focused and a much more productive product at the end of it. Productive product, that, that doesn't make sense. That's not what I was trying to say. Uh, you can be more focused while you're recording because it's going, do your parts, send them to the other guys, hit them back. So it's, it's a pretty cool way of working. And, uh, you know, honestly, like I said, it's not too dissimilar to the way 
Uh, I've worked in the past doing the ragdoll stuff where, you know, we've done the drums and maybe one of us, two of us, all three of us have been in there with the engineer tracking everything. And then whenever I do guitars, normally I do them at home. And it's just me and the producer Troy doing guitars. And then same thing for vocals, you know. I just try to stay out of Ryan's way when he's doing vocals because a lot of the time, you know, it's that old saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. So a lot of the time, as long as you're working with a decent producer or there's kind of someone in charge, I guess, cracking the whip, then you can get really great results. And there's no reason why you can't do that uh, with file sharing. That's also one of the reasons why we've gone out of our way with the next Ragdoll album to try and do some stuff uh, actually live where the three of us are in the studio and we're tracking stuff and we're rehearsing stuff and then laying it down, which has been really, really fun. I think it's definitely more fun doing it that way, but it's not necessarily any more productive. All right, Lick of the Week is going to be a tapped chordal kind of thing. It's not really a lick, it's more an approach, but uh, this is kind of borrowed from guys like, I would want to say, Steve Hackett and Steve Howe, and the idea would be this. Take an F major 7 chord. If you don't know how to play an F major 7 chord, this is a voicing. I'm using 8th fret on the A string, 10th fret on the D string, 9th fret on the G, and the 10th fret on the B string, and then you can also bar your first finger so that you get the 8th on the high E. So those spell out F major 7. So that's pretty cool. And you can play that with your thumb. And then what we're going to do as a basic idea, we're going to tap out another voicing of F major 7. The voicing is going to be basically diagonal from the 12th fret on the E. So 12 on the E, 13 on the B, 14 on the G, and 15 on the D. So you have and then what you're gonna do is hold this chord down and tap those frets with your pointer finger, so. So that's the basic idea, and you could take a chord progression like this, F major seven, E minor seven, D minor seven, A minor seven. So that's pretty straightforward, and what you could do is, use the A minor scale and tap around that. So essentially the scale shape that I would use would be something like this, uh, basically 15, 13, 12 on the top two strings. And then 14, 12 on the G. And then 15, 14, 12 on the D and the A. So. They're the notes of, whoa, I just kicked the camera. <laughs> They're the notes of an A natural minor scale. So you could do something like this. This is, this is the actual lick. Would be strum your F major seven. something like that anyway. So the little melody would be, if I hold down this F major seven chord, have a look, we're tapping on 12 and pulling off. And then we're tapping 13 and 12, pulling off between each of those on the B string. So. And then on the G string, it will be 12. Tap, pull off, tap, slide to 14, slide up to 14, slide back. So you get this. And then practice it with each of the chords. So then play E minor seven, D minor seven, and then A minor seven. So that will be the basic thing to practice and then you can just kind of improvise with it which is pretty fun. What I'll do is I will turn some chorus and some reverb on. I'm going to use the new Boss Dimension C2W and the Red Panda, what's it called? The Context uh, on a gated reverb setting. And I'm using some compression and amp modeling from the Axe FX3 and it sounds like this. <laughs> This 
is probably the funniest question I've got on here. Would I rather be tag teamed by the McDonald's mascots or hear the faint sound of children laughing every time I masturbate? Well, this is like one of those questions like, you know, uh, would you, <laughs> would you, would you rather like kill your granny or kill a newborn baby? You know, no matter what you answer somebody, the, the whole point is that the question sets you up to go, oh my God, you're sick. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I ever want to get tag teamed, so yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Why'd I agree to answer this? Turn it off.